So far, so far, so good. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, uh, you, you had posted several articles about uh, developing further development of uh, the MICA and EIDS uh, framework uh, in LinkedIn? No, I posted uh, an article about the uh, CBDC project. Well, it's not a project, uh, the, the CBDC uh, development in China. Yeah. And is contrast, that what you were referring to? Uh, I think that is that is correct. Um, yeah, you know, you are involved in so many projects that I because well, no, I'm, I'm I just have to be honest. I have a passing intro. Well, I have I'm not an expert in that field, but I was struck by the yeah. announcement by the Central Bank of China that uh, their CBDC project has uh, been. Uh, Launched. deployed and used by 260 million Chinese people. I mean, can you believe it? 260 million. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, this has been going on for a while. They are pilot projects. And of course, in China, everything is at a big scale. Uh, yeah, and... but it's, uh, it's mine. I mean, I think it's, uh, and I was making the comparison. I don't know where the US stand in this field, but I was making the comparison that in Europe, uh, there's indeed a, a digital Europe project, but it's still at the so-called um, uh, investigation phase. And yes. that is supposed to last for two years. I mean, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Know, uh, we're I'm... not on the same track, I think. <laughs> well, the point is, uh... It's a totally different uh, kind of system. There's a command and control uh, system versus something else. So, but uh, what would be interesting is to see what kind of identity solution they used. They use in uh, yeah the in these solutions. You know, there is they published a, a research and development a research paper last year which yes. I came across only recently. Um, it, it has, uh, it's more on the macroeconomic side, you know, of this, uh, of the project rather than the technical debate about, uh, but I think it's not uh, decentralized as you would expect somehow. And um, it's, um, but what it does, uh, and I think this is an interesting development, it does, claim to be offering offline functionality. And that itself is, um, um, that itself is, is quite a, a significant, uh, if that is true, I think it is true, but that is quite a significant uh, achievement. Yeah, in fact, um, two years ago, I was taking a look, a deep dive into all the patents that mm -hmm. the Chinese have uh, filed. Um, and it's not clear to me that parts of the system are not on the blockchain because there are about, out of the 80 patents, about 10 or 15 are on blockchain. Uh, and of course, they talk about the wallets being tiered and the, at the lowest level, mm -hmm. uh, it is supposed to be offline um, wallets. So you can transfer small amounts of money between people. So it is yeah. in that sense, a true token, just as a uh, dance uh, group Accenture is promoting in the digital dollar project, which they say should be a uh, token-based approach similar to cash because cash yeah. is the ultimate token. You you. You don't need any uh, any identification to spend it, and it's meant to be anonymous. But I doubt whether the Chinese uh, system is completely anonymous. No, uh, it's not. I think uh, you know. I think that would be <laughs> that would be asking for too much from the Chinese. Yeah. <laughs> Although they 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 claim to, they claim that up to a certain amount, it is anonymous. 
And about certain amount, it's less anonymous. What what less anonymous means is is uh, is up to you know is up to anyone's you know it's anyone's guess. But um, what they are saying is uh, below a, a certain threshold, it's uh, a fully anonymous, which may well be true. I mean, to be honest, uh, who cares if you're making a you know a ten dollar payment. Uh, to someone else. I mean, does that really matter? I mean, it does matter maybe from a, a purely macro uh, economic point of view, but not in terms of uh, Mr. X is making a payment to Mrs. Y, for example, right? Yes, but, true. Um, the, the point uh, uh, though is that how, you know, for the higher tiers, you're supposed to have a wallet that is uh, coming through, you know, what is called the two-tier system, right? The mm -hmm. banks are going to do KYC and they issue a wallet and that wallet is capable of holding more and more and more funds de depending mm -hmm. on the level of KYC they've done, the level of accreditation that is in the system. So that is that much is clear. I had written several articles actually in Forbes about this. Um, and there is of course a debate going on about privacy versus uh, anonymity. So yeah. what is anonymity and what is privacy and what is what is the difference? Maybe that's another topic that we should be discussing and how do you implement it inside Hyperledger technologies? That would be mm. a, an interesting takeoff. But anyway, coming back to our, um, you know, our today's, roadmap, we have, you know, several people on the, on the call. Maybe we should be uh, posting up the ideas that we, we, we had sketched out and maybe people can add to these ideas and also say uh, whether they'll be willing to participate in some of these topics. So I see somebody has already dropped off. <laughs> uh, so here is uh, Alfonso very helpfully putting up the on the chat the ideas uh, that I had put in the uh, email. So that includes um, a creating a task force for working on the identity working group paper uh, to be more of a uh, systemization of knowledge on identity in Hyperledger and beyond. So uh, I, the whole focus of the paper has to turn a little bit. So that's the first one. The second one is identity working group standards from DID, VCs to the ISO. Uh, then the idea of micro ledgers, which we did uh, go into a little bit uh, with uh, Kerry and uh, Corda and ideas like that. Then identity portability in Europe, implications for other jurisdictions. This is your uh, this is your specialty, Stefan. And then digital wallets, which of course would. Uh, say where the where you know where the identity that is used in digital wallets would um, be rooted in we don't mm -hmm. know uh, whether it should be anonymous pseudonymous or not at all uh, you know or or completely anonymous like like uh, what we were just discussing uh, the other point that uh, Roland Fauré raised was identity theft. What happens when your identity is stolen uh, directly or indirectly? And what happens to all your assets? If everything is in a digital wallet, how do you uh, shelter the assets uh, you know, from a thief? in the sense that they've already, your identity has already been compromised, your private key and so on. Uh, what can be done 
uh, either to A, recover the money or B, to prevent transfers. So there are a lot of ideas uh, about that and actual code inside um, inside a hyperledger to do that. The last point is what are the implications in the so-called Web3 and metaverse universe uh, with respect to identity? I mean, does identity enter the picture or is it? So there is always that balance between privacy or anonymity and the need to know because if you're doing bad things, how do they identify you? And you know, how do they stop people from doing crazy stuff? Uh, so anyway, this is the background. So I, I think what we need to do right now is just walk down the people who are here and see whether you know these uh, ideas are worth pursuing. And how do we do that practically in the context of a once a month call and so on. So Dan, do you have anything to add to this? Or any practical tips? Uh, and you're muted Dan, if you want to talk. Otherwise, uh, we go down to, let's say, Ronda Okamoto. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. I'm not sure why my camera's not working, but anyway, um, I wanted to introduce myself. I represent a company called ID Shield and Legal Shield. And that's actually what we do. We help people monitor their personal identifying information. We have a network of fraud investigators that once you sign up for a subscription model, they will help you with any online frauds or anything that may have happened. However, we, <laughs> we have not got it into the digital wallets and I'm not really sure what a fraud investigator could really help you with. So it is, um, actually why I came to the blockchain community because I'm into the crypto and I always wondered what would happen or who could help with fraud in that case. And my business partner that helps me run a blockchain organization actually had five NFTs taken from her OpenSeas and MetaMask wallet and they were able to get in. And now they've even threatened that if she doesn't send some ether to an account that they will actually publish her driver's license, passport, and husband's credit card information out there. So this is a really bit, you know, interesting topic for me. And this is why I came here today to you know, learn about what the blockchain community is trying to help with that fraud. Yeah, Jim is uh, on the call right now. So Jim, we are discussing how do you deal with identity theft? as one of the topics in our list of topics. Uh, Jim is having microphone problems, he says, um, but he can always type on the, on the chat with any uh, insights. Um, in terms of what you just said, uh, it seems to be a combination of uh, thievery and uh, ransomware, because that is a usual ransomware uh, sort of demand, you know, which is that we will dox you, we'll publish your information, uh, or we'll lock up everything and whatever, uh, what? you know, some threat, which is basically aimed at you personally and seeks to either embarrass you, inconvenience you or, or um, uh, you know, yeah, Basically and even steal, when steal from you. He when she reached out to Open Seas and uh, MetaMask, they told her, you know, they would help her. And then she found out the person who from Open Seas was trying to help her was a scammer because then he asked for some ETH. I was just like, this is crazy. And I've heard other people had, you know. Yes, because Web <laughs> Web3, according to many who have been writing on this, is highly centralized. 
Uh, right. At least the at least uh, the way it is being uh, implemented, uh, you know, there is only two or three sites that control access because nobody is running a full Ethereum node. So Infura, Alchemy, uh, and uh, OpenSea's for NFTs is just about it. You know, MetaMask mm -hmm. connects to the Ethereum blockchain through these uh, through these intermediaries. So, mm -hmm. uh, so that is why, uh, you know, that it's not decentralized. Moxie Marlin Spike, a famous cryptographer who's the actual originator of Signal and of uh, um, rotating uh, keys, um, published an article about this. And I will have the reference to it in our meeting minutes, because I'm already looking into it for another project to do with the NFTs. Uh, anyway, it boils down to, you know, do you have delegates who can act on your behalf? Uh, can you have it? So there is the tension between owning your private key and being in complete control um, of your assets. And then of course, the private key being stolen or somehow compromised, you losing control of everything or having it be, you know, some kind of a tiered thing. That means for five, spending $5, you don't need anything, but for higher uh, cost, then you have a multi-sig or some such idea. I, I don't know, Dan, uh, do you have anything to contribute about in, in that regard? No, no, I, I don't. You're right in that Accenture is in that space, um, but uh, I'm not. I'm focused on identity, not, um, yeah, not. Um, but identity theft uh, should uh, figure in identity at well, least. It, at least a little bit, so. Uh, uh, yeah, but not the ransomware bit. Yeah, you're right. Um, uh, maybe it's something I need to get smarter on, but uh, I'm not at this point. <laughs> so we will we will have a session which deep which is a deep dive into that. Uh, maybe I'll try to get uh, some people uh, who are experts in that. Maybe Dan, you can hook me up with some people who are there. So maybe in a month or two we will definitely have a session on that because that seems to be very important uh, for us. And it, uh, it impacts Web3, Metaverse, every, everything you can think of. Whatever, wherever you're acting as an agent, if somebody else can act as you, then what happens? And the reverse problem, which is you acting as multiple people, which is civil attack. We, we've already uh, sort of looked into that uh, in a little bit of detail last year here. Uh, but I, I think this is a changing and evolving landscape. So we have to have at least a recipe uh, you know, a, a list of ways or methods in which uh, we can handle that. So all of that will, of course, feed into our uh, systemization of knowledge paper. So, you know, all, all the things that we have mentioned in the as being important will uh, all feed into this to a paper that we will keep alive because obviously uh, we can't just list the current methods and hope to cover the universe because the universe is constantly evolving. Um, so Rhonda, you said something about, uh, what about uh, Ricardo McCarty? Do you have anything to contribute? We were just talking about what are the uh, topics relevant to our group and how we can engage and present 
uh, Jim and uh, Jim Sinclair and I had a, a meeting where we were the only two, and we uh, discussed that this group is more on the strategic and a bigger picture side, whereas the technical uh, working group, like uh, identity implementers working group, uh, goes into the details of hyperledger. Uh, technologies and how they help with, um, you know, how they are actually implementing some of these uh, ideas. So I'll bring up uh, the idea of identity theft to some of them. But anyway, Ricardo, now that you uh, heard about this, could you tell us why you are here and what do you hope to contribute or learn? And uh, Stuff like that. Do you want me to take you off mute or are you okay? I guess, uh, I guess uh, Ricardo is in the uh, same, um, same camp as Jim having microphone problems or he doesn't want to talk, which is okay. Um, Alfonso, do you want to say something about all this? Um, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Vipin. And thank you for, for keeping this group alive. Okay. I, I appreciate what, what you do and the rest of the group has been doing for, for all this time. Um, from the ideas that you put for consideration, I am particularly interested in the SOK and the systematization of knowledge. Um, towards the creation of standards, which is point three. And uh, being from Hyperledger Latino America, uh, the issue of jurisdictions is, is relevant for, for our region. So those are the, the, the three aspects of this working group that I would like to, to be involved with. Personally, you know that I'm interested in NFTs and, and Nifty and, and the, other, the other projects, but here, SOK, standards and jurisdictions. I think that is quite important for our region at a strategic level. Great, uh, so, you know, uh, we have to, in order to contribute to the group, uh, you can go to the main page of the working group and there are meeting minutes, even for today. You can make comments, you can add, it's all wide open. And you can, of course, uh, reply on emails, uh, which are also saved if you're, it's on a list. Uh, so all of this stuff is... Uh, you know, you know, the ways in which you can participate, there are so many of them. But the thing is, when you're faced with a plethora of choices, you probably freeze. So you just have to take one of them. And, uh, you know, just like uh, when I came to this country and I went to the cereal aisle, I saw 250 types of cereal. And I said, what should I buy? And I left the store without buying anything. So too much choice is almost the same as no choice <laughs> sometimes. Anyway, so what I'm saying is, you know, there are many ways to participate. There are, the topic uh, is very broad. So I think the way to start is by choosing something very specific and adding to that stream, knowledge, questions, anything. That matters. And I'm hoping to publicize more of this group's uh, uh, activities and get more people to show up. Unfortunately, I posted up uh, the LinkedIn message only this morning. Uh, I have just, I'm just involved in too many things. Um, maybe another lesson for me to be <laughs> a little more disciplined. Uh, but anyway, 
Jim, you're still uh, still uh, stuck in the no microphone thing. Dan, you you have anything to say because you're you have unmuted. No, no, no. That was from before. No. Nope. Okay. So, um, any ideas? You've been involved with this group for a while, and there are lots and lots of new groups. Uh, Toip. Uh, well, I should probably say T O I P. Otherwise, Jim Jordan will uh, will probably kill me. Uh, the Others, you know, the CCG, um, but they, you know, everybody is pretty much in a very technical bent. So I hope to elevate the conversation a little bit. So um, Dan, uh, as a long-term member of the group, what are your uh, thoughts about 2022 and where should we be focusing? Uh, I think you're... there's going to be a lot of um, uh, movement on um, uh, wallets uh, with the EU legislating uh, the EU identity wallet, um, uh, Canada pursuing an identity wallet uh, that's going to have to be certified somehow based on some standards. Um, I think the other thing that you know is happening, certainly in trust of IP and others, um, is uh, uh, establishing trust across networks and how do you, um, yeah, how do you... Um, Interoperability of trust, I guess. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, what what parameters do you need? What levels of trust? Well, how do you trust it? And are there going to be levels of trust, kind of like levels of assurance, um, which has a technical component and a a uh, human component. Like if um, if I have an identity assurance level because I did uh, a rigorous identity proofing process, well, there's human trust around that. Like even when passports are issued, right? We trust some countries more than others. That's why we have visas and visa waivers, right? So how are we gonna do that? And what information must be shared in order to uh, automate that? So I think, I think that trust ecosystems and wallets are going to be big. Okay. Um, so I'm going to keep a note on the chat. Uh, anybody else? Yes. Hi, Vikram. How are you? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Somebody said you can go. You can go, Stephen. Yeah. yeah uh, okay. Um, I just wanted to um, raise a question, maybe because I've been, I've been, I'll be, I'll be honest with you. I've been struggling with uh, DLT in the field of, of digital identity for a while, and one one of the reasons I've been uh, struggling is that I find that, um, and this is of course very relevant from uh, within the EIDAS to um, context is that you need to address the offline uh, situation. That's, uh, that's an explicit uh, regulatory requirement and you can understand why it's there. And I was wondering if uh, as, as one of the topics that we um, could discuss or at least consider during the year would be, you know, how do we, how does, uh, DLT addresses that uh, offline. Is there no way around that way? What's uh, what's the likelihood? Because I, I, you know, every time I'm <laughs> facing that issue, I'm you know I'm stuck, and I, I get the impression that people are stuck basically. Well, I mean, if I understand your question correctly, it's similar to uh, what we have with um, with uh, centralized um, public key infrastructure. Um, like for smart cards and stuff. If you have a smart card today, like um, whatever that is, you know, in order to, or let's say a passport, same thing. Your passport is a smart card. It's ISO 14443 um, mm -hmm. AB, right? So how do you, how are you going to authenticate it offline? You have a, a copy of the, um, uh, of the, the credit, you know, the, the certs, right? You have an offline copy of that. Um, 
the the uh, yeah. So people do this today. You download your CRL, your certificate revocation list, and whatever your um, whatever your risk appetite allows, whether that's 24 hours, 48 hours, once a week, once a month, you have a local copy of it. Um, will it get out of date? Yeah, um, uh, but right now, like even ICAO for passports, the PKD is uh, updated, what, once every month or once every other month or something like that. So same thing for um, decentralized public key infrastructure, whether you're using a DLT or, or not. Um, you, you know, you have a, a copy of it that you download every so often, whatever that often is, is based on your business rules. In other words, uh, what uh, Dan is saying to you, Stefan, is this problem exists today without DLT. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, why should DLT? Yeah, but I, I get the impression it's worse for, you know, for DLT. I mean, uh, is, is that a... Is that a uh, you know, no, I maybe, think it, maybe maybe it's a misconception. I mean, I'm not you know I'm not uh, technical enough to probably to give you an authoritative opinion, but I, I I get the impression that people are stuck with that issue. Yeah, I mean there are two or three uh, ways in which offline payments are um, done. Right, one is you issue uh, a smart card or a card, but that presupposes a reader. You got to have a reader to uh, uh, to do this. Uh, there was an interesting uh, uh, interesting um, presentation in uh, Capital Markets, which I also run, where uh, they talked about crypto notes. That means you have a note that is printable using a um, uh, you know, it has something, some mark on it that shows that it's legitimate. Either you get it from the bank and then you spend it and the merchant can actually, instead of taking the note to the, uh, uh, to the bank, can actually put it in a, deposit it through a wallet. And mm -hmm. once they deposit it, that note becomes uh, invalid. And there are ways in which the note itself on the face can show whether it is spendable or non-spendable. In other words, there is a, a ink on the notes that becomes sensitive uh, to the spendability or non-spendability. So that's one method. The other method is of course, all the different uh, local currencies, right? I mean, you can, Da, uh, you can create local currencies that you can spend in the local area. Uh, the problem that you're bringing up still is, a, is according you know, uh, like what Dan said, still a problem for uh, the current infrastructure. The only way out of it is of course cash. Uh, you know, cash is the only thing that you can use uh, in a disconnected yeah, setting. So, uh, but cash has problems too. Like in the in the case of uh, the Caribbean, where there is a lot a lot of hurricanes, for example, and there is destruction. So, distribution, physical distribution of cash becomes a challenge. Yeah, uh, cash and, is uh, cash is expensive as well. I mean, it's not yes, you know, it's not free yes, at all. Have, yeah, you have to safeguard it. You have to yeah, yeah. Uh, guard against theft uh, at the point of uh, payment because the guy who's standing behind the cash register could dip into the cash register. You know, uh, then you have to deposit it every night, every or in a safe, whatever. You know, there's all kinds of. And then, of course, if you are talking about a trillion dollars in cash. That's about 18 truckloads, uh, 18 truckloads of $100 bills. I mean, for, for the US uh, currency, but maybe uh, nine truckloads <laughs> for, for Euro because you have higher denomination. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this, yeah, definitely would be an interesting topic to talk about. 
uh, and the main thing is addressing existing uh, implementations or solutions to the problem, not just belly aching about, oh, this is a problem, that's a problem, you know, we have 500 problems. Okay, we have 500 problems. Now, do we have 250 solutions to some of those 500 problems or, and what are the problems with those solutions? You know, what do they address? How far do they go? And so on and so forth. So these, these are the practical uh, sort of uh, ideas that we have to come up with and we have to get good speakers. So I need your help to channel people. Uh, last year, you know, the latter of the, of the year, I was completely snowed. So I, I did not uh, give as much attention to this uh, identity working group as I should have. Uh, but I think uh, it's one of those New Year resolution things. We'll have to see whether it lasts beyond January, in my case. <laughs> Good. Well, let's hope it does. Um, yes. Uh, so, Mr. Uh, Mr. McHardy, do you have anything to... Hi, Zipin. Uh Sorry about earlier. I, I figured I... It's 12 p.m. my time, or this meeting started 12 p.m. And I uh, had a goal to listen while I was eating lunch. And when you asked for my take on anything, I had food in my mouth. So I figured it wouldn't be, you know, uh, kind to speak. But uh, just to <laughs> introduce, yeah. So uh, Especially not kind you. to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So um, adding to some of the stuff with Steve, let me just introduce myself. I'm Ricardo McCarty from Neotech Solutions. We design and develop uh, proof of concepts and solutions on the blockchain. Just to add to what Stephen has said and what you have you know, discussed regarding hurricanes. Uh, I'm from the Bahamas, I'm based in the Bahamas. And just to give my take on what Stephen said, what you and Stephen said about you know, uh, legal tender, fiat currencies, uh, yes, uh, the, those the distribution of those and the safeguarding of those has been a problem and will be, continue to be a problem uh, regarding uh, post disaster assessment and the like. And you know, in those situations, uh, money you know fired it's not even legal tender because you know where the destruction is such at a, a catastrophic level, uh, that there, there is no way to use the cash and there is no way to assess how it can be used. So basically it's, it's worthless. And uh, what my government has launched uh, a project sand dollar project. I'm sorry, project sand dollar, uh, you know, it's a CBDC. I'm sure you guys have heard of it. Uh, the goal of this is to mitigate uh, some of that. Uh, you know, they have uh, contracted a company to create the skeleton and, you know, other uh, private institutions and private uh, digital service providers can build solutions on that uh, project for you know the Commonwealth of the Bahamas at large, uh, where we can you know mitigate some of this and also leverage it for you know digital identity purposes and also add interoperability. So uh, perhaps maybe if we can find it's still in pilot phase, but you know if we can find some use case data for this. Uh, we can use this for the discussion or any discussion that you guys may have in the future. Uh, I would be happy to contribute that, you know, from my end, if it means anything. Oh, definitely. Um, I, I am actually in touch with uh, some of those guys, and I actually wrote an article, two articles uh, in Forbes about it. One was about the Sand Dollar Project when it was launched, and the other was with the Island Pay, which is a uh, which is a payment service provider. And I had an interview with uh, Stephen Douglas. I, I mean, not Stephen uh, Douglas uh, is his last name. I don't remember his first name. But anyway, he was a very interesting guy. And his main point was there is an interoperability between the CBDCs and the rest of the, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, the credit card infrastructure infrastructure, uh, specifically through EMV. 
um, which is a standard established by Visa, MasterCard, and Euro, uh, Euroclear, Euro, Eurocard, EMV. So, uh, but, you know, inevitably, when we are talking about uh, identity, it seems like we are coming to talk about use cases, right? Because in the end, identity is worthless without use cases in the real world. And use cases are kind of hobbled if they do not have a proper identity system. So there is a close interrelation between these two um, ideas. And that, that's why when we talk about identity, we invariably get to how is it implemented identity system, like Stefan says, implementing identity systems using DLT. But there is also the other side of it, which is if you're having a use case for CBDC, how do you how do you integrate an identity system into it? So that's that's what we are interested in, but obviously it has to be in the context of use cases. So Ricardo, your uh, contribution would be welcome there. And going back to, uh, you know, do you have anything more to add to this? Currently, uh, not not as yet, but. Uh, but what does Leo do? Uh, as I said before, we design, develop, and deploy solutions on the blockchain. Uh, similar to what we spoke about with Project Sand Dollar, there was a project that we had, you know, the a pleasure of collaborating on with another Caribbean island, Dominica, the M. Lejean Wallet Project. Uh, they started to, you know, implement this idea after a catastrophic hurricane, you know, hit the island. Uh, five years ago, six years ago, it's 2022 now, six years ago. So this is not Dominican Republic, but Dominica, no, right? Dominica, yes. The Commonwealth of Domin Dominica, not the Dominican Republic. Yeah, so I've been there. I've been there. I love it. Lovely country. So. Yeah, they were. What we uh, did, what yeah. we did, we, we, in a technical sense, we, you know, developed their technical workflow processes on how, you know, interoperability, because, you know, Dominica is a small country, it's a small island nation. So use cases and any solution of that sort, you know, would be, you know, more or less ideal for a nation that size. So what we wanted to do, uh, similar to what you spoke about what they're doing with San Dollar, we wanted to make sure interoperability was paramount and that, you know, the integration with the Dominica Cooperative Societies League and any other credit unions that they partner with or that are subsidiaries or um, in any relation to them, that clients' funds and uh, financial access and financial inclusion would not be restrained. So where do you source your identity uh, um, information from in that context? We would have to get it from a third party service provider if it's applicable. Okay. Yeah. So we anybody, so anybody in the uh, in the suppose I'm a tourist, mm -hmm. okay, and I'm I've, I've gone to Sufriel, and I'm stuck there mm -hmm. during the hurricane, and I don't have any cash with me, or any any way to spend money so that I can buy food, let's say, or pay for my lodging. How would that uh, work in terms of I mean, did you guys go into these details or is it, was it still in the sort of uh, thinking phase? Where oh, it's launched in? currently. Uh, in, that, in that regard, if you have a cell phone, a smartphone, sorry, you can access your details via a QR code, uh, via SMS confirmation uh -huh. or by email confirmation. Okay, but if, if the network itself is down, 
which is what Stefan was talking about, uh, where you, uh, there are two, two caveats there, right? One is yes. a, a, a way to phone home, phone somewhere so that they can verify you. Second is the availability of electricity itself. So you have two constraints, one more drastic than the other. And that's why is what is meant by offline capability, because once your phone drains of electricity, battery, and uh, you have no way to connect because the network is not available, then you know what do you do? So this is this is a conundrum even before. I mean, like like we were saying, it, it's not solved in today's um, infrastructure properly, but they are looking for ways to solve it in um, in the latest you know ways of doing things. Right, um, and I presume that is why we're all gathered. That's the main reason to discuss how these things can be done, potentially. Yeah, so we go through the literature that is out there. We try to get uh, the people who can answer some of these tough questions. Um, you know, and try to make uh, you know, this available to others who are grappling with the same question instead of having to rediscover everything again and again and again. Um, that's why, you know, maybe you, Mr. McCarty, can help us by uh, either talking or researching about this problem, you know, like the identity, how, how is it proven? Second, in when there is a huge catastrophe, how do you address it and target funds to the people who really need it? And who are those people who really need it? Again, comes back to identity, right? I mean, and in the end, like in the last uh, go around here in the United States, we had problems during the pandemic uh, where it was proven that a lot of people who don't who didn't deserve uh, money got uh, PPP loans and all kinds of grants. Again, it boils down to identity and proving that you are really one of those categories. And how do you do that in the midst of, uh, you know, infrastructural damage? Uh, I know that uh, Dan would probably say it has to do with uh, biometrics to a certain extent, because that irrevocably links you to something that you are. So. There's something that you have, like a cell phone or credit card or whatever, or cash, something that you are, you know. So there are specific ways in which you prove who, you know, you are who you are. Uh, there is a gentleman who joined just now. His name is uh, Victor P. Um, and wondering whether he has anything to contribute to this discussion of what we are talking about, which is how do we create a, um, a forum that is useful uh, to address some of these questions that are, you know, sort of top of the mind or, you know, not solved. Uh, hey, Vipin. Yeah, I uh, I saw your message on LinkedIn, and I thought I thought I would just join and listen in, really. To uh, you know, I don't have any, unfortunately, no solutions. I've sort of been following the 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 problem 
um, for a while now in, in different venues, mostly starting with identity on blockchain for, for medical records and such. But, um, you know, I, I do think that connecting with biometrics, you know, is, is one thing that, that's happening. Um, it's really, and you know, but there, how to bring in, there's all these companies now trying to help you verify your credentials with government IDs, et cetera, you know, bring your own business, know your own customer, all of those type of things. And, you know, is, is that one thing, but um, yeah, it's, I think it's, to me, it's, it's the, everything is going to depend on identity and proving it and making it easy, maybe part of your wallet, et cetera. And the solutions for that are, you know, too many for my brain right now. So that's why I'm trying to, you know, if there's anything I can contribute, but it's really more understanding where things are going and how to understand it. I mean, in order to uh, talk about that, we have to see exactly uh, what, what you do, you know, what your experience has been so far in the world. So obviously we may think that whatever we do is not relevant to the problem or whatever, you know, uh, we can dismiss our own selves. What, what I'm trying to say is you probably have more knowledge about certain things than many others on this call. And that's why I was asking you where, you know, where do you work? What, you know, you don't even have to say, where do you work? But what has been your experience in this world with respect to identity or other topics so that we can, uh, you can contribute based on that. And of course, ask questions is also, asking questions is also contributing. I also have some, it's Ron, I also have something to add when you were talking about the stimulus. You know, um, $72 million was sent in the stimulus check, 60,000 60, stimulus checks were sent to deceased people. And then the treasury tried to get back the money. And I think that totaled about 72 million. So that's a really big number because, you know, where does that money go and who's, you know, paying out the stimulus? It's that's why it's tax. We should be concerned about, you know, government can't even tell people are deceased or not as well as, you know, do they qualify, but you know, you're sending out money to deceased people. I know that's an idea. Well, uh, well, the point is, if it's seventy-two million dollars in the context of one point eight trillion dollars, is it's not much actually. But that's a, a separate question. Uh, how do we even prevent zero dollars from going to dead people? Uh, the problem is, you know, they use uh, the uh, IRS filing status from okay. not just. In, in 2020, uh, they used it from 2018 to, to drop the checks. Uh, so if you are uh, talking about a two-year-old uh, data, in two years, yeah, many many people just you know pass away right. because uh, I mean, in a well, large country like ours, uh, to 350 million people, you know, I don't know how many people die every year, but Definitely some of them uh, who filed taxes in 2018. So you have to go to the root of the problem. The root of the problem okay. is you are relying on two-year-old data uh, filed with the IRS. And there are people who don't even file taxes because they go below the yeah. filing amount. Or, so, you know, one, so they didn't get the money. You know, <laughs> all, so all have the you stuff. guys. Have you guys ever talked about like what the government can do? I know it's social security number, but could there be some other identifier? Because, you know, social security is a mess, but have you guys ever discussed? Yes, we have discussed it. There is a visceral uh, opposition to a national <laughs> identity system. Um, so instead uh, the banks and financial institutions and everybody else for that matter have cobbled together a system that relies on uh, social security numbers, which are functioning today as a national identifier, uh, digital identifier. 
other countries have recognized this sort of problems and they, uh, so, so we come to the crux of the problem. The crux of the problem is, okay, so how can you become a citizen? One, you're, you're born in this country. Second, you're naturalized. So uh, these are the two usual paths. If you're born, then you go back to the Genesis documents, which is basically uh, birth certificates, uh, things like that. But unfortunately, the birth certificates are managed at the very local level. Uh, hospitals, uh, corporations, uh, you know, like in New York City, you have to, you, you know, it basically goes to the New York City Municipal Authority, uh, you know, whatever they're called. And in order to get a proof, you have to go there. So how do you tie in this sort of a decentralized uh, genesis system to a national identity uh, where the payments for, uh, you know, for uh, let's say for uh, this PPP loan or um, stimulus check, I have to be distributed to all the people in the country. These are real problems. And I think it is also, you know, people's um, natural tendencies to say, oh, I don't want a government identity. But in effect, they are using social security number, uh, which is not oh. set up to do this as, you know, the national well, you know, what you said about when, when you're born in the hospital, babies get a social security number. Well, you know that back in, I can't remember what year it was from- They don't get time, a social but, security number, by the way. they You have to apply separately to the social right. security administration. No, I'm saying, yeah, but you know, when you're but, born, they have you fill out the paperwork. But you know, the, the numbers that the babies were getting in the hospital, social security numbers and such, those are already compromised because the criminals had figured out a way, you know, sequential number of social security. So then social security went to randomizing social security numbers. And then that became a mess because they couldn't tell if that was fake or not. Cause it was, you know, based upon the decade, the area that you were born in and the year. So now it's kind of a total mess. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the point is it should never be based on uh, a secret meaning Wait. Social security number should not be something that it, that should be a secret only known to you. It's obviously not. You're sharing it with hundreds of uh, people and you know, it ends up on the dark web. It ends up everywhere else. So that should not be, it's like saying my digital identifier or my license uh, uh, number for New York City, uh, you know, New York State license is somehow special that that should be uh, somehow figuring into uh, me proving who I am. They constantly ask me the last four digits of my social security number. I'm sure those last four digits are known to, you know, I mean, if it's, uh, if I'm, I'm uh, more than 60 years old. So by now I'm sure it's out there, you know. So this is the problem, the system is compromised from the beginning, like you said, from birth. So we have to have a different system, but there is a very vigorous opposition to having a national identity. It's not so the case in, in Europe or in India for that matter, Aadhaar ID, and in many other countries, but everywhere people are scared of uh, surveillance. And I'm sure that if I lose my Aadhaar number in India, and if somebody else uses it, there are tough penalties, meaning, you know, you go to jail. So here, you know, the thief just walks away if they haven't actually done anything uh, very serious, like, you know, compromising my identity, stealing thousands of dollars of my money. Anyway. The time has uh, come to the top of the hour. So we will talk about national identity systems and why such a system will not work in the US for cultural reasons. Um, thanks for showing up.
and uh, hopefully I'll have a more coherent and cohesive um, presentation. And please help me with finding people to talk on this. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Ruth. Thank you. I was just going to mention that, you know, I'm with the Government Blockchain Association. We are actually doing a virtual event on the future of money and governance, and it is hitting on some of the things that you were talking about. Um, would you like me to add that to the chat or? Yeah, you can add that to the chat. Uh, I will or be you sharing. Want me to... I'll be sharing. Are you on the, uh, where did you hear about us, our uh, meeting today? Oh, um, Bobby Muscare, she's Hyperledger, and uh, oh. Jim Sinclair, and, you know, everybody. So, yeah, I've known about Hyperledger for a while, and we've always had speakers come in and talk about identity. So it's, you know, a big topic for me because I've been following, you know, all the theft in the regular world, financial system. So in the crypto, it's just even more. And then also I'm a part of the Diversity in Blockchain Philly chapter where we're doing um, crypto asset planning. And you know, how do you communicate to your loved ones what your digital assets are? So that's kind of why, why I wanted to join oh, this group and learn about what you guys are doing as far as you know, trying to. Yeah, we, you know, it's it's a it's a group that right now is meeting only once a month. So we are only um, you know, we we only meet once a month. So we're trying to figure out how we can okay. reboot this. Uh, to be useful to the community. Uh, Identity Working Group was one of the first to be set up in Hyperledger, uh, maybe even as far as back as 2015, 2016. And I was in some of the first meetings, although I was not the chair. But, you know, we it's, it's always difficult because there is a technical aspect there is the policy aspect. There is an integration with actual use cases. So identity pervades, it's, it's like a bottom uh, foundation, well, right? I think people should be more scared of central bank digital currencies. That's a real surveillance. <laughs> well, I mean, depends on how you, we, we talked, we started talking about it with Stefan with the Chinese, um, situation, or whether they really have anonymous uh, transfers or small amounts like buying pizza and let's say Kung Pao chicken, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it, anyway. So, you know, Thank less you. than, let's say hundred bucks. I mean, are they going to take, are they going to be concerned about it or will it join a flood of data uh, that will be completely anonymized so that they can say, okay, retail spending for uh, food is X, you know, because all everything in the end boils down into macroeconomic considerations as well. Thanks for uh, showing up and thanks for the, uh, for, uh, contributing by making statements or asking questions. And hope to see you in the next meeting, which will be next month, uh, four weeks from today on Wednesday at 12 noon. Thank you. See you next Thank you, month. Vipin. Thanks, bye. Bye-bye.